lecture of our PhD uh, graduate uh, seminar, um, which today actually is, is going to be uh, a bit dense because uh, unlike the previous chapters, uh, which were focused uh, on one uh, particular author, um, today actually I have collapsed in, in one presentation three books. Uh, as you know, uh, the seminar has a very modest uh, goal, uh, which is not to add anything new on these uh, books, uh, but to simply glossy, uh, to gloss uh, them, uh, to see if uh, uh, they can propose issues or problems that, uh, in a way, are still relevant um, today. Um, and in fact, um, I, I have to say that it's a pity that I had to do this, uh, let's say, uh, grouping. But of course, uh, in order to really have a rather even distribution of interest, uh, the, the, the span of the seminar required that sort of uh, concentration. So I had to basically collapse, in fact, three books which are uh, absolutely uh, important for the development of architectural theory uh, in general, uh, and especially of architectural theory uh, in the 16th century. Um, forgive me if I, uh, I will, in fact, give more weight to uh, an author rather than the uh, other two, uh, because um, I think, it, in a way, for me, uh, especially in the context of this, uh, let's say, lecture series, he's the most uh, important, the one I would like also to discuss uh, more in depth. Uh, and this author is uh, Serlio. Uh, and I will be very short, actually, on, on Vignola and Palladio. I'm not sure even if I will be able to. <laughs> it's the first time I'm giving this seminar, so I, cannot, I didn't test yet the, the length of, this, uh, of these lectures. Uh, first of all, um, it's, uh, it's uh, very important, actually, to see these three uh, architects uh, together, because I think that through, uh, I mean, there are more uh, uh, books uh, produced in the 16th century that deal with, with, the, with the theorizing of, of architecture, but there is no doubt that these three books are the most important, which, uh, and I have to say that uh, this is really uh, the moment uh, in which uh, books uh, becomes uh, the most influential tool to transmit uh, architectural knowledge, and of course for, an obvious reason, uh, uh, which I think uh, everybody could guess, uh, which is the invention of printing, uh, which allowed uh, something that uh, was unprecedented, the mass production of knowledge. Uh, so if, uh, of course, uh, books uh, existed also uh, before, uh, as you can imagine, the, the labor of copying them uh, by hand uh, would take uh, a long, very long time. And for that reason, books were rather diffuse, but the diffusion was pretty much balanced by this uh, technical difficulty. Uh, but of course, the invention of printing uh, uh, changed completely uh, the landscape of even reading and, and, and writing. Um, and architecture actually is one of the discipline, actually more than any other discipline that is uh, dramatically affected by this uh, technological, uh, let's say, invention. Because uh, while for uh, Alberti, one of the fundamental problem of transmitting architecture was the uh, impossibility to rely on images, because uh, unlike uh, written uh, text, uh, images are, require a lot of skill and talent to be copied uh, uh, in a precise way. Uh, of course, this is, uh, was, as you know, the crux of Alberti, and the reason why he only trusted the uh, language, the, the written uh, text. But uh, this actually happened just before the invention of printing. With the invention of printing, this problem was somehow uh, not completely, because we will see that also uh, within printing, that there is a margin, of course, of, let's say, uh, interpretation uh, and falsification, which, uh, of which Serlio was uh, a very interesting early uh, victim. Uh, but of course, uh, the invention of printing allow architects to trust images and to use uh, images as the fundamental medium of, uh, of architecture. And I would argue 
uh, that I would say that from this moment on, not buildings, uh, not artifacts, but images of buildings, or let's say images related to the representation of architecture, plants, elevations, uh, perspectives, uh, becomes the fundamental medium of architecture, and I would say the very core of architectural knowledge. I mean, today, uh, even today, uh, where we have much more uh, possibilities to travel and to visit buildings, uh, I think we can all admit, uh, without uh, being embarrassed for that, that most, uh, I would say, 99% of our knowledge of architecture is through basically images. You know, of course, in, the, in, in our case, photographs and even uh, videos. But this sort of reification of architectural knowledge through images uh, is a process that starts precisely at this moment uh, and in a way um, produce a, a new form of uh, uh, understanding of architecture, which was, is not anymore a discipline only for few cultivated patrons uh, or few, let's say, very skilled uh, painters uh, or sculptors who can also become uh, ad hoc uh, uh, architects, but uh, with the uh, mass production, let's say, of uh, of uh, architectural knowledge through uh, printed books, uh, creativity itself, um, I mean, to be an architect is basically mass produced. Uh, and there is uh, no doubt that, the, let's say, from uh, 16th century to 18th century, these three books, uh, uh, Serlio's uh, seven books on architecture, uh, Vignola's The Rule or the Canon of the Five Orders, and Palladio's uh, four books on architecture, are actually the fundamental textbooks uh, of uh, architectural knowledge, as, 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 as until actually the invention, the dismiss of uh, the classical orders as the main language of architecture, of course, will make these uh, teachings much less uh, relevant. These actually are just, uh, I will be very schematic because to, to I, I mean, it's uh, almost embarrassing to, to, to concentrate in one hour a discussion on these three uh, architects is uh, almost impossible, so my lecture will be like blocks. Um, these are uh, the portraits uh, of these uh, uh, architects. Uh, um, uh, Serlio, um, and a, a portrait that uh, might be uh, a portrait of Serlio painted by uh, Tintoretto. This for sure is the portrait of Vignola uh, because this is actually what appears in the frontispiece of uh, his book. And this is actually uh, perhaps the most uh, uh, uncertain uh, of these portraits. At that time, we were not yet in the age of uh, El Croquis, so uh, buildings were more important than the face of uh, the architects. But sometimes they, they also uh, may have the portrait by a very famous painter like this one, uh, who is Paolo Veronese. Maybe, we are not sure, uh, and this might be the portrait of uh, Palladio. Very interesting, Palladio, there are no uh, known, I mean, it, it, uh, I mean, in spite that he's absolutely famous architect also in his, uh, during his life, there are no certain uh, portraits uh, of, of him as a persona, and actually nobody knows where he was buried, so there is not even a, a grave. Uh, and this tells a lot about the difficulty uh, of Palladio in the last years of, of his careers. Uh, I cannot really tell the whole story, which has been recently uh, reconstructed, which is very interesting and also very tragic also. And this might be also the reason why uh, Palladio felt finally the urge not only to write a book, uh, so to not trust buildings, but something that would be much more uh, enduring uh, his fame, but also for the first time uh, to include uh, projects by himself uh, in an architectural theatre. So in a way, the four books, uh, uh, we can say that this uh, can be also read almost as a kind of personal portfolio. Uh, of Palladio uh, as an architect. So it's a book not only on the general knowledge of architecture or an, on antiquities, as we have seen uh, with examples before, but it's also a book uh, that is almost autobiographical. And of course, uh, the, 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 it, it has actually a very specific uh, message, which is also, among other possible interpretations, to basically give to the work of Palladio uh, a much more clear and enduring, uh, let's say, uh, reputation. But um, as in the previous uh, chapters, I would like to stress a bit the context in, in which these books were written, which is something that is always, in a way, 
in the background. Of course, um, the, for the sake of brevity, I cannot really elaborate this, let's say, uh, this contextual uh, reality. Uh, and therefore, it might sound a very uh, abrupt and uh, a bit cause and effect uh, relationship. But um, for me, actually, it's very interesting how, and I actually stress also this with the with the with presentations before, uh, there is an interesting symmetry uh, between uh, the rise of architectural theory uh, as something that really can be seen as a, an encyclopedic attempt no? to, to take knowledge and to give knowledge, not only actually knowledge about building, but knowledge about cities, knowledge about customs, habits, and to give it a strong uh, encyclopedic uh, structure on one end, and at the same time, the rise of uh, social and political conflicts. That's in a way where uh, situations in which uh, uh, these habits, uh, this knowledge uh, was uh, questioned, was radically uh, under threat. Uh, last time, for example, I mentioned the famous Tumulto dei Ciompi, uh, a famous uh, short-lived revolution that actually uh, I was thinking about it uh, during this weekend. And I didn't stress something that is very important uh, when we talk about these events, uh, because we're always used to the idea of, of a revolution. Uh, a revolution, uh, it's a very uh, particular concept, uh, which of course uh, always uh, rise the bar of social change uh, in, impossibly high. No? Uh, we always complain, oh, we, cannot do a, we cannot have a revolution. But in fact, that's precisely the problem when we talk about revolutions. The Chompi and also the event that I'm talking uh, today were not really revolutions, uh, but tumulti. Uh, tumulto means a revolt. There is a fundamental difference between a revolt uh, and a revolution. Of course, a revolt most of the time ends uh, tragically for the people who actually start uh, a revolt. Uh, and the Chompi revolt, and this one especially, the famous Battle of Frankenhausen, where uh, uh, they, they ended uh, tragically for the people who were fighting uh, in this, uh, I mean, that started this kind of revolts. Uh, but, uh, and that's actually very important, uh, they have a very uh, enduring uh, effect uh, in changing uh, our own perception of, of a particular historical condition. For example, the tumulto uh, threat power, force power to take measures uh, to reform uh, very often power itself in order to prevent uh, other tumulti, but very often they have a strong symbolic appearance and the symbolism of a revolt is sometimes even more powerful than the symbolism of a revolution, precisely because it's very intense, it's very, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, has this kind of uh, sudden uh, appearance, uh, change dramatically the landscape of a particular city. I mean, think of the Occupy movement. Everybody now is saying, well, it, it failed, it didn't know what to, what to ask, what to do. But on the, at the same time, it's, it's a movement that uh, has been able to at least change no, our own uh, perception of certain issues, or even our language. No? The, suddenly, certain words become very charged with a very specific symbolism. And even the place. No? I mean, now if you want, go to Wall Street, uh, you don't think only Wall Street as the space of, uh, let's say, capitalism. but you also think about this uh, uh, counter subject. So that's actually the, the, the why I want to raise these uh, events, you know? not as something that, of course, had an immediate or direct uh, relationship with what I'm talking about, but more as these kind of symbolic events, which at that time have a, a very strong uh, impact and completely change, actually, the perception of, and it's sometimes even the language and the habits through which uh, let's say, things were seen. Now, um, I want to actually focus on, the, on this uh, event, which is the Battle of Frankenhausen, uh, which happened in Turingia in 1525, so exactly uh, just before uh, the time of explosion, let's say, of architectural theory as a new, let's say, very important activity by architects. This is a painting that you can still see in this amazing panorama uh, that uh, was built uh, during the, Repub the Democratic Rep uh, Socialist uh, Republic uh, of Germany uh, to celebrate uh, this event because uh, Friedrich Engels uh, uh, saw uh, that uh, the Battle of Frankenhausen was the first class struggle, no? one of the first uh, uh, battles which was fought uh, on the terms of class and not uh, ethnic uh, and purely religious uh, belonging. It was led by uh, 
a very important uh, figure, Thomas Munzer, uh, an allied of Martin Luther, who at a certain point detached himself from uh, Luther, and in fact um, guided uh, uh, a multitude of peasants to revolt against the lords of uh, Thuringia. Uh, this, uh, of course, the, 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 the event ended uh, tragically, but he had a, a rather shocking, enduring uh, influence on the mind of people, and especially intellectuals and artists, uh, because for the first time uh, you have the rise of conflicts uh, and struggles which would not clearly be identified within the established canon no, of what is uh, warfare or conflict, which is usually at that time was built on the terms of uh, religion uh, or, uh, let's say, uh, ethnic uh, conflicts. Uh, of course, uh, in the Battle of Frankenhausen, class terms, but also religious terms are mixing. Munzer was, uh, as I said, an allied of Luther. It was clearly uh, a symptom of the way the reform, uh, the Protestant reform was impacting, uh, um, let's say, the civil society uh, at that time. And just to give you an example of what consequences uh, these conflicts uh, had, uh, and this is actually a clear direct consequence of this uh, famous event, I will just show you this uh, rather enigmatic, curious uh, monument uh, designed by uh, Albrecht Dürer just after the Battle of Frankenhausen, which is actually a monument, uh, a column of victory, uh, a, a very important uh, uh, celebration, uh, form of celebration, which you can see, for example, in Trafalgar Square, which is usually built after a victori victorious uh, uh, important uh, battle or, or war. Uh, what is actually strange about this monument is that instead of celebrating the winners, um, Dürer, who actually is siding with Luther against uh, Munzer, ag against the, pa the peasants uh, that started the, the revolt, so in a way should uh, the column is supposed to celebrate the winning of the lords against the peasants. But uh, you, you have to imagine that these sort of new conflicts, new uh, polarizations are not yet clearly articulate. And in the consequence is that Dürer makes this uh, celebration of those who have lost, the peasants. Uh, and the uncertainty between uh, victory and defeat uh, is emphasized by the mix of genres that uh, Dürer show in this column. Uh, I mean, the column is really, as we have seen with Vitruvius, the up the acts of architecture, no? the classical architecture. It's not just the structural element, but it's also the rhetorical, uh, let's say, uh, archetype. And here we have a rather comic uh, column made of uh, peasant uh, tools, so a kind of mockery of peasant uh, life. And then the, the, the peasant stabbed in his back um, uh, and I, of course, an image that uh, uh, refers to uh, the famous iconographic theme of uh, Christ in uh, distress. So you have uh, a, a very uncertain uh, symbolism, which actually makes uh, a, a comic uh, mockery with a tragic, uh, let's say, rather uh, strange celebration. Because of course, on top of the of the column, you have rather a defeat uh, figure. So the re why I want to show you this, um, this monument is to really introduce the core of the uh, problem that we are addressing uh, today, which is the increasing, uh, uh, let's say, distress of architectural theory, uh, especially architectural theory that comes from a Vitruvian uh, uh, legacy to cope uh, with these uh, new uh, problems, new conflicts, uh, new ethos. And trying to give to these uh, problems uh, a solvable uh, representation, which, of course, as the Dürer monument shows, uh, it's um, almost uh, impossible uh, without ending up in this rather enigmatic or even grotesque uh, compositions. I want to actually pair the statue of Augustus and, uh, and our, uh, let's say, Dürer uh, monument to show you actually what is the problem here. With Vitruvius, we have a clearly uh, a subject uh, who has uh, taken uh, a mastery and control of an empire and is able with his uh, rational uh, imperium, uh, epitomized by the gesture of uh, speaking, of addressing a community to basically rule and construct a cohesive uh, political body. 
On the other hand, we have this situation where, in fact, uh, power has problems, not only to control this conflict, but also to give them a clear uh, univocal uh, representation. And this is exactly uh, the crux that uh, we will see behind the books, and especially one book that we will uh, see uh, today. As I said, I will give more space to Serlio. Maybe we will even end up with, with Serlio, so I hope uh, that will not be the case, but I will do my best. I have my, the clock just in front of me, so I will make sure that we can cover all three uh, authors. First of all, um, there are many things that make Serlio a breakthrough uh, in architectural theory. The first one, of course, we have just uh, made this uh, point. Uh, Serlio heavily uh, rely on images. Uh, so he's really not talking to erudites uh, or patrons or princes. Uh, Serlio is talking to architects. He's the first uh, author uh, who really uh, speaks uh, a language that is familiar to our own, uh, let's say, profession the profession of an architect. And in a way, what is interesting is that, uh, in a way, Serlio himself is the proto-teacher uh, of architecture, the professor of architecture. Partly because, of course, he had very little chances to build. Uh, he built very few things, and perhaps late uh, in his life. So he had, as he himself actually said, a lot of time to, to be busy, actually, with, uh, with architectural theory. But the fact that he had actually made that kind of contribution uh, makes clear that, in a way, this new knowledge uh, and the transmission of this knowledge through books is, in a way, a fundamental. It's needed. Uh, and, and, and somehow, uh, Serlio can find a, a market uh, for it, which, in fact, will be uh, rather successful. Unfortunately, more when he will be uh, dead, uh, as uh, very often happens to uh, authors. Another very interesting aspect of his uh, work uh, is that he uh, published not all the books in one uh, book, as we have seen uh, before, but he published actually book by book and not following the uh, numerical order he gave to books. In fact, the first, uh, as you can see, the dates are very important. Uh, the first book uh, published is, in fact, the book on the five orders, which is published in Venice in uh, 1537. Uh, and all the other books actually follow uh, this publication, but not following actually the progressive uh, numbering uh, of them, which is a very interesting strategy because uh, it immediately shows how Serlio is extremely elaborate and articulates uh, in not uh, being completely straightforward in his work. There is always something hidden, something that is, but at the same time, of course, this was a publishing strategy to use uh, each book uh, as a teaser for uh, the other book. So you would read the book four, uh, and he would mention something from book first and second, and of course, while reading the book, you would be eager to wait and perhaps buy uh, the, next, uh, the next book. Um, a very also important thing that characterizes Serlio's book is that he's the first to theorize uh, the five orders uh, of architecture. Until Alberti, the orders of architecture were three, uh, or fourth, uh, like in the case of uh, uh, Vitruvius. Uh, with uh, Serlio, actually, a new order is included, the most uh, hybrid one, the composite. Uh, but also there is something very interesting about the way Serlio, who is actually the first to really uh, talk about uh, architectural orders as we speak uh, about them today, uh, and the way he understands uh, this famous canon uh, of architecture. Uh, while actually um, for Alberti, uh, the order was not just the column with the fragment of the architrave, of the trabeation as we understand today orders, for Alberti, actually, the, uh, the type, uh, the, let's say, architectural, what he call architectural type, which is actually architectural order, was the structure, was the structural, uh, let's say, grammar of trabeation column, uh, but seen in its entirety. Uh, well, actually, uh, Sadler is the first to think the order as a fragment, as a piece. This is a, is a very important uh, aspect of his understanding of orders because it gives to Serlio unprecedented flexibility, not only actually to change proportions and to use them in different ways, but also to use them together in always uh, not uh, necessarily orthodox ways. 
even if uh, Serlio professed himself, unlike Alberti, a, a big fan, a scholar uh, of uh, Vitruvius. And you have to uh, really, uh, and we will see this with Vignola, you have to really understand that, uh, especially in the mid 16th century, when this problem of uh, the Protestant threat uh, to the dogmatism of the Catholic Church is very important, uh, this observation of rules, observation of canons, and especially observation of Vitruvius rules uh, becomes a very sensitive uh, problem because to challenge the Vitruvian canon is a, a sort of analogous uh, thing than to challenge basically the orthodox uh, rule of the Catholic Church. And in fact, it's not by chance uh, that in the mid 16th century there will be precisely in Rome an academy that will study philologically uh, Vitruvius' legacy. So in a way, this Vitruvian canon uh, is experienced almost as a sort of the embodiment uh, of the canon of the Catholic Church against the threat of, uh, let's say, the Protestant uh, reform. And actually, uh, Serlio's role vis-a-vis -vis this uh, threat is quite ambivalent. On the one hand, he professed himself uh, to be a big, uh, strong, rigorous scholar of Vitruvius, uh, and uh, he actually had also he comes from the group of architects. Uh, he's a scholar of uh, Peruzzi, but he's very familiar also with Bramante's work, and Bramante has been one of the most, uh, let's say, intelligent interpreter of uh, Vitruvius. But as we will see in his books, there are clearly signs that uh, uh, Serli also likes to challenge this canon in a rather, uh, let's say, uh, fundamental ways. And in fact, we will see, especially in the Extraordinario Libro, the extraordinary book, uh, uh, Serlio will, uh, in fact, uh, uh, attack uh, in a very interesting way the, the hegemony of the Vitruvian uh, canon. Another quality that characterizes uh, Serlio's book is his incredible effective layouts, the way he combines text and images. You see here, actually, this is the, from the book on uh, uh, Antiquities, book two, and you see actually the rather smart uh, and precise way, but also effective way in which uh, uh, Serlio mix uh, text and captions. In fact, in Serlio's, the, the text is no longer this rather scholar, it's in today we would say text by Alberti, but it's a rather a very light and, and, and sharp uh, captions, but how he mix actually uh, orthogonal projections with eventually uh, axonometries or details in order to really explain these monuments in one, uh, let's say, in the most effective uh, uh, way. Also, a remarkable aspect of Serlio's work is that he's very consistent with orthogonal projections. So he's really trying to master uh, architectural representation to a degree that it can become really uh, a language uh, that cannot uh, leave, uh, let's say, uh, doubt uh, and, and problems of interpretation. So this, um, the rise of orthogonal projection is, is also a very important aspect that characterizes the way uh, Serlio communicates um, architecture. But I would like to now focus on, for me, the most important book, um, which in fact is uh, the only, uh, well, one of the two actually that um, Serlio was not able to publish uh, of the entire collection. And in fact, remains in the form of two manuscripts, one in, uh, uh, in Munich and one in uh, Columbia, the Avery Library. Where in fact, uh, um, Serlio deals with the, the question of habitations. Uh, this is really uh, an amazing book because uh, we could almost say that uh, for the first time uh, the problem of housing, uh, not just uh, architecture for churches or palace, which was the way architecture was used uh, till that moment, you have to really understand that uh, very few patrons could afford an architect you know, to uh, design a project. Uh, so the fact that uh, uh, someone is dealing with uh, habitations, also modest uh, habitations, housing, uh, is rather unprecedented because at that time there is not yet uh, a market uh, for an architect dealing with what today we would call social housing. And yet uh, Serlio, uh, who is actually rather sensible, uh, and that's actually also the reason why, among many other, he will uh, go to France to spend the second part of, of his life, because at that time, France is more tolerant towards uh, evangelic and Protestant, uh, uh, let's say, confessions. And in a way, Serlio is a sort of sympathizer. Uh, he's close to people that are 
very eminent figures of Italian uh, uh, Protestant uh, uh, reform. And it's within that kind of ethos, uh, as you know, uh, one of the fundamental aspects of Protestant reform is to emancipate merchants and professionals as a, a powerful, distinguished economic class within the city. And it's very interesting to see how Serlio, in a way, design projects uh, in his uh, theatres, which are meant to be for uh, all classes, uh, from the very poor peasant to the very rich uh, uh, merchant uh, and to the uh, rich uh, citizen. Uh, of course, what is interesting is that architecture becomes uh, very vernacular. You have to uh, think that Sergio Wright designed this book while he's in France, so he adopts a lot of uh, architecture from the place where he's uh, living. Uh, the orders, uh, the fundamental canon of architecture till that moment, uh, gradually seems to disappear. Uh, so in a way, uh, the architecture of Sergio is an architecture that is uh, very much driven by comfort uh, and decorum, a strong uh, co quality that, uh, that Serlio stress uh, in his book, which means uh, meanness, you know, to be mean, to be normal. Uh, Serlio really wants to design uh, the houses for normal people, people that are neither, uh, let's say, uh, uh, too aristocratic or too uh, poor to afford even the most uh, miserable, uh, let's say, hut which, of course, uh, Serlio uh, designed. But, of course, he still is living in his own age. He still has to uh, design also buildings like this, like, for example, the house for the prince. It's interesting, you know, in the same book, to have the house for the poor peasant and the house of the prince uh, within the same range of uh, possibilities. But um, Serlio is also a rather pragmatist. Uh, uh, writer. I mean, he's not imagining like uh, a sort of social utopia where everybody likes uh, each other. And in fact, uh, one of the most uh, comical, uh, interesting uh, moments of uh, book uh, Sixta is actually when he, of course, proposed a project for a prince, but so why not? Also a house for the tyrant. And of course, he recommend to build the, the house in the form of a fortress. So this really shows uh, Serlio's uh, Pragmatism almost in the verge of being cynical and ironical versus the powers that at that time uh, controlled the city. You have to imagine that uh, between the 15th century and uh, 16th century, a lot of rulers have come to power in a totally illegitimate uh, way. And, and Machiavelli actually stress you know, this uh, point uh, in The Prince uh, that one of the fundamental weaknesses uh, for a tyrant uh, is not that he's a bad or an ugly person, but simply that the people he has um, subjugated are not very, they don't really sympathize towards him. No? So the tyrant has two enemies, uh, the enemies outside the city, but also the enemies inside his own territory. And so, um, Serlio, who is a pragmatic, pragmatic uh, theorist, a realist uh, theorist, design also a house for uh, such a figure without any attempt to idealize uh, the rather unstable, uncertain political condition of Italy and France uh, at that time. But uh, what is actually even more curious is the follow-up of uh, book uh, six, uh, book seven, which is uh, translated in English as a book on situations. What are situations? Situations are the rather uh, uh, bizarre uh, urban conditions in which uh, architecture has to be built. So, um, for example, uh, uh, in this book, uh, Sergio advised how to unite different properties in one uh, building, but also how to insert uh, a palace, uh, so something that till then was always built uh, as a self-standing uh, construction, completely freed from the context around, uh, within a rather intricate uh, urban condition, which of course uh, has uh, a lot to do with the way, uh, l uh, let's say, uh, we could say almost uh, the, economic, the economics of uh, land uh, division uh, works produce this rather bizarre off-square uh, sites. So uh, Serlio advised how to adapt the Vitruvian canon to this rather strange and sometimes impossible um, contextual 
uh, let's say, conditions. Uh, and he produced a series of plants which are absolutely stunning for their clumsiness uh, and uh, complete uh, distrust for any sense of symmetry and, and let's say, uh, decorum that was very strong in uh, uh, Vitruvius' idea of architecture, where, as you remember, symmetry is not just a way to organize the building, but it also has a strong symbolic uh, rhetoric about what the building is meant to represent. In a way, these strange uh, sites, these off-square sites, were, uh, in a way, give the opportunity to Serlio to, I would say, almost ridicule the pretensions of a Vitruvian architecture to control the real conditions of the city, where uh, we would say a, a class of nouveau riche are now able to afford, uh, let's say, architecture. And architecture becomes actually, uh, has to pay a price, which is to basically become a, a rather uh, bizarre and sometimes grotesque, uh, let's say, um, form. Um, in, the, in the seven books, um, uh, Serlio never uh, theorized uh, the project of the city as such. Uh, in other words, he never put forward uh, a plan uh, or a cohesive uh, scheme, like Filarete, for example, through which to ide uh, idealize the, the, the city as, a, as, a, as an artifact, like Vitruvius, for example. But in book uh, first and second, where he talks about perspective, uh, he creates a, a series of uh, stage sets which will have a, a terrible influence uh, in the 17th century uh, theater uh, stage, where in fact uh, uh, he um, seems to almost put forward uh, what would be the outcome of uh, book uh, sixth and book seven. No? So the, as usual, uh, Sari always have this kind of deceptive way to, to bring a message. No? So I, I think it's fair to speculate that precisely within the realm of fiction, and theater, uh, he finally put forward what would be the result of this crazy city where architecture address uh, all classes. He developed these famous two scenes, the tragic uh, scene. Of course, in theater, there are different situations, the tragic and the comic. Uh, the tragic scene has this rather centralized uh, space, uh, which is uh, dominated by the gate and the obelisk, and of course, refers to the way uh, uh, the street especially becomes a new tool to organize the city within one cohesive, uh, let's say, uh, space. But you see that uh, apart from the street, uh, which is clearly addressed uh, through perspective, uh, architecture becomes rather exuberant and totally freed from any uh, overall uh, design uh, constraints. So there are different styles, different uh, languages uh, can uh, coexist. And then there is the comic scene. Uh, and what is interesting is that while the tragic scene uh, is made of Vitruvian, uh, I mean, not all the buildings, but most of the buildings are made by Vitruvian architecture, architecture of columns and trabeation, the comic scene is a, a, an occasion for Serlio to really portray it with incredible uh, cynical realism what was the city at that time, not this totally chaotic, uh, uh, agglomeration of buildings, uh, uh, most of them built uh, in a rather precarious uh, way with no sense of proportions, where actually, in fact, the only means of control is the ground, is the, is the uh, urban space, which is very interesting because really introduced what we'll see uh, later on, no? how uh, the order of the city is gradually uh, moving away from the problem of representation and the problem of orders the problem of facades, as we have seen with uh, Alberti, and moves to basically the realm of space, no? of basically uh, the managerial control of space, which here is symbolized by this rather Cartesian, uh, almost super studio-like uh, histogram, no? surface, uh, that uh, uh, constitutes the, the very uh, ground of uh, the city. But as I said at the beginning, the most uh, extraordinary in the literal sense, the most bizarre uh, book by Serlio is the extraordinary, uh, extraordinary book. Uh, the book that, in fact, it was not officially intended to be a part of the collection, but that Serlio publishes as a sort of PS, as a sort of extraordinary uh, book within the, the sequence. What the extraordinary book uh, deals with, with uh, a rather useless an innocent topic, Gates, uh, is a book that is uh, uh, illustrating uh, 
something like 50, uh, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, gates. Uh, but uh, these gates are um, characterized by a rather bizarre and at some times uh, frightening uh, compositions. Uh, what is interesting is that um, Sergio makes clear at the beginning of the book that this book uh, is about architectural mistakes. Huh? And he said that uh, this is exactly what an architect shouldn't do. So he's clear that the book is showing uh, monstrosities. Uh, he, he really talks about uh, monsters uh, uh, when he talks address these uh, gates, because they completely deconstruct and hide the purism of Vitruvian uh, language. He proposed, uh, I mean, a, a sort of sixth order, no? which is neither Ionic uh, or Corinthian or Tuscanic or Doric or composite, but is a kind of uh, bestialized uh, order, uh, an order, an animalesque uh, order, which has no rationality uh, anymore. Um, but uh, what is interesting, the, the way he explains some of these uh, gates, some of them for um, Sadly, are absolutely um, um, mistaken, so they really clearly shows what is uh, wrong uh, in, in architecture. But some of them have a, a more ambivalent, um, let's say, meaning. Uh, for example, in these gates where you see a Doric order uh, almost eaten by this kind of, I mean, of course, something that with uh, development of mannerist and Baroque architecture will be very usual. And actually, Sergio will have a lot of success as a, as a theorist, but you have to imagine at that time, this is not really a usual language for architecture. And what he actually, the way he explained especially this gate is very interesting because he said, well, most of this gate is made by brutal, animalesque, mon mon monster-like uh, forms, uh, like natural forms, like natural stone. But once you actually remove uh, this uh, form of barbarism, you really have a, a pure Vitruvian uh, Doric order. Now, so what is interesting is that uh, we have seen how for Alberti, the architectural orders were basically a convention, no? uh, an habitus, uh, were an ornament. No? And therefore, they, be, they will always be constructed and artificial, like all social uh, conventions. Sergio go even further with that kind of uh, critique, now showing uh, orders which are uh, absolutely unacceptable uh, by showing actually what the architect shouldn't uh, do. He almost shows the, the moral uh, of orders uh, themselves, which is uh, something necessary, but at the same time something we can always distrust. And it's exactly in this sort of ambivalence, not to profess uh, uh, an order, and Sergio is, is not, uh, he doesn't have any sort of uh, uh, fantasy to challenge you know, Vitruvian architecture, but at the same time, it gives us also the possibility to see them as grotesque uh, conventions, something that eventually can become monstrosities. Uh, and that nevertheless are important uh, in order to understand what is true architecture. I mean, this, there is a, a very, uh, an evangelic uh, flavor no? in this idea that in order to make something good, uh, you have to be bad. That's actually what Sergio is trying to say. You have to actually uh, deeply uh, put yourself in something that is so impossible to accept uh, in order to discover what might be the truth uh, of, of architecture. And the truth is exactly in that sort of uh, moment, you know, in that kind of ambiguity between what is uh, right and what is wrong, which means that architecture is no longer just a tool to reinforce a certain ethics, you know? in this case, the ethics of power, but it's also a moment in which ethics uh, can become more uh, autonomous because they can judge between what is good and what is wrong. And in fact, Sergio leaves this uh, line uh, rather ambiguous, especially in the Extraordinario Libro, where in fact, you are never sure when, even when Sergio is uh, denigrating a certain uh, example, there is always a, a little side note of admiration and even interest in doing that particular, uh, let's say, uh, rather uh, uh, precarious uh, and not uh, uh, rightful uh, exercise. But uh, a, a little, uh, let's say, conclusion of, of Sergio's uh, contribution to architecture cannot uh, avoid the Perhaps the most uh, uh, interesting, and I don't have time to elaborate as it should uh, deserve uh, this part, most interesting book, which is the one on castramentation. 
uh, a book uh, that is only drawn. It was never uh, published uh, in a printed form until uh, very recently. And it's a book that trying to reconstruct uh, uh, from based on Polybius uh, histories, the form of Roman uh, military camps. What is interesting about this book, uh, especially if you see uh, this book parallel uh, to book six on habitations, uh, is to see how uh, Serlio reduced the plan of buildings, the plan of, uh, in this case, uh, two uh, very strict uh, diagrammatic, uh, let's say, plans. Of course, there are tents, there are temporary buildings, uh, but uh, this becomes an opportunity for Serlio to employ uh, a language uh, that is exactly the language of modern architecture, the language of diagrams, the language that do not anymore represent architecture in its built substance, but as an organizing uh, uh, device. And in fact, the most extraordinary part of this book uh, is a reconstruction of what's supposed to be a military camp, uh, but Sergio represents it as a, as a city, so with ter a bath, uh, with temples, with uh, palaces. But Sergio actually represents this plan uh, as a built uh, city. So it transforms something that is temporary, the military camp, in a real uh, ideal city, which actually he developed uh, in details. And the most extraordinary part of the city is this part on housing uh, of the uh, soldiers, which uh, in a way can be seen as one of the first projects of mass uh, social uh, housing. And you see actually the abstraction of this carpet of habitations that have no facades anymore, only corridors, streets, and room, so uh, habitation is reduced to its most uh, generic uh, properties, no? the properties of social uh, uh, reproduction. So in a way, the opportunity to reconstruct an ancient Roman military camp began for uh, Serlio, an opportunity to, sum to summarize uh, his approach to architecture, where in fact, organization, housing, uh, management, of a, of a new, actually, emerging class of inhabitants becomes more important than the truthful representation of, of an order. So in a way, uh, in, in, it's exactly after Serlio that uh, there is this sort of um, explosion of um, architectural theory, that architectural theory becomes a specialized uh, genre. Uh, that involves uh, many uh, practicing uh, architects, but it's also, uh, Serli actually, as I said before, made popular the picture book. The book, uh, the architectural book is no longer driven by a text, uh, by uh, a sort of, it's not no longer organized around uh, a story, uh, a clear, let's say, identifiable narrative, like in Alberti's uh, De Edificatoria, which you really can read uh, as a book, uh, as a novel almost. Uh, it has a, a beginning and an end. Uh, after Serlio, uh, we really have the uh, practitioner manual, the architecture for dummies uh, book. The, a book that doesn't tell anything if not how to make uh, basically correct uh, Vitruvian architecture. The most uh, important example is Vignola, uh, the canon of the five orders. Uh, unlike actually Serlio, Palladio, but also Alberti and Vitruvius, Vignola doesn't concern about anything if not uh, architectural order, so it's the thinnest uh, book uh, on architecture. Uh, what characterizes and what will be important actually for Palladio is that it's the rendering uh, of, uh, through which Vignola represents architecture, which unlike the very rudimental woodcuts of Serlio are very actually uh, elaborate uh, plates uh, with a very refined actually uh, drawing, uh, which, uh, the, whose resolution was at that time unprecedented. But of course, I mean, what one can see in Vignola is the uh, rise of this um, counter-reformist ethos no? of uh, making rules uh, absolutely uh, important, uh, but at the same time empty. No? I mean, uh, Vignola really embodies this kind of idea of after the crumbling of uh, the architectural canons. You know? There is a, a sort of attempt to recuperate uh, architectural language in a way that is both strong, very accurate, very precise. Vignola is an extremely talented uh, architect, but is an empty architect. He's an architect who has no whatsoever message 
uh, story to, to represent. And actually, that's the atmosphere that you can feel in his plates of a, a very refined, precise uh, practitioner, but completely uh, unmotivated by any social or political project that, of course, was never the direct topic of architectural theory. But one can sense that in Albertis and, and Serlio, there is a project. There is actually an attempt to drive architectural knowledge towards a specific, uh, today we would say, vision. Huh? With Vignola, that does not exist. Vignola just proposed pure, empty uh, architectural form. And of course, beautifully drawn, because one should say that uh, Vignola's plates are absolutely fantastic, and they will have, precisely because their refinement will have a huge influence of, on all uh, architecture till basically the 19th century. And finally, uh, Palladio, the last uh, of the trio, the one perhaps where I should uh, talk uh, the most, but we have very little time, so I will be very short. I will say just a few things. The fact that Palladio, why Palladio wrote the four books. Unlike Serlio and Vignola, um, as I said before, Palladio was interested to build basically his own portfolio. Of course, uh, he had a, a, a strong interest towards uh, Roman architecture, triggered by two figures that are uh, behind uh, Palladio's project of uh, revisiting uh, classical architecture, Gian Giorgio Tristino, and especially uh, Daniele uh, Barbaro. Barbaro, uh, together with Palladio, made one of the most uh, refined versions of Vitruvius' uh, The Architettura, illustrated by, tra translated, uh, let's say, edited and translated by Barbaro and illustrated by Palladio. But also, you have to imagine that Palladio himself uh, was, on one hand, a very successful architect uh, that happened to work in a rather unstable, uncertain uh, uh, urban context. Uh, uh, Venice, Vicenza, and, and Venice. Uh, Vicenza, a rather uh, successful mercantilist uh, city in the 16th century, was one of the most violent uh, cities uh, in Europe, uh, especially because Vicenza uh, in the 16th century is the epicenter of uh, reformist uh, culture uh, in Italy. So there are a lot of conflicts, uh, social, political conflicts, which often would stop uh, the builders uh, that would commission Palladio's buildings to, to stop, to, to, to take on hold their projects. I mean, Palazzo Porto perhaps is one of the most pathetic testimony you know, of Palladio's problem, which was he had never seen one of his buildings completed uh, during his life. Uh, and this is actually perhaps one of the reasons uh, why he felt the urgency to do something that uh, at that time was absolutely unprecedented to include uh, uh, his own projects uh, into basically uh, an architectural tetris. Uh, book, uh, the Palladio's books are organized in four books. Uh, of course, the four book uh, is an introduction, uh, which of course ends uh, with a description of the uh, orders. But the second book uh, is a book where in fact uh, Palladio shows uh, along uh, examples from antiquity, also his own uh, buildings. Uh, and especially his own villas. Palladio is an architect that has uh, concentrated most of his career in the design of what today we would call real uh, estates, which of course have a strong uh, role at that time, at that moment in the Serenissima Republic, because it's exactly at that moment that uh, uh, Venice has to shift its economic interest from the sea to the land and reclaim the land as a fundamental asset of his own geopolitical uh, power. That's actually why Palladio design all these villas. These villas have to do with that sort of social and political reform where agriculture becomes a, a fundamental uh, tool to govern uh, this new uh, territory. Uh, of course, you see how the layout uh, of the four books, which by the way is absolutely elegant. For me, it's one of the best book in architecture, not only for its content, but for its uh, graphic design. Very simple but also very elegant. The text is uh, it's beautifully written, but also the composition text image. You know? It's very clear, very clean. You know? There is not this kind of uh, little bit messy, uh, uh, let's say, layout of Serlio, but of course, uh, Palladio copy a lot, take a lot from Serlio. These are actually, uh, of course, his uh, villas. You see uh, how Palladio gives to this typology an unprecedented uh, uh, relevance, uh, especially, uh, as you know, the villa uh, 
uh, it's, it's a kind of evolution of, of Serlio's you know, habitations, but what is actually amazing is the combination of a very urban typology, the palace, with the uh, rustic, uh, let's say, uh, barns, uh, the barchessa. So in a way, the villas of Palladio are a strange hybrid between a palace and a barn. And of course, the abundance of loggias uh, really emphasize this relationship with the landscape, uh, which was also a, a way to frame the people who would live and work uh, within these uh, fields, and especially in the Barques. So, so in Palladio's actually building, there is a strong paternalistic uh, message. You know? The Lord is in the middle, and the workers are with, with, with the Lord. So there is a, a, an element of social reform. So the, the farmers are not longer, uh, peasants are not longer living no, in some kind of uh, dispersed uh, place you know, in the countryside, but they live with, with the Lord, with the patron. They are part of the same uh, building. But at the same time, of course, the patron is in the middle, and of course, the pediment, which Palladio is the first to use uh, in a, a profane building. Well, the very first is uh, Giuliano da Sangallo in the Palace of Paggio a Cagliano, but. Um, Palladio is very consistent in using the pediment for a house. And you remember in the discussion about Vitruvius that the pediment is really like the, uh, the, the, the symbol of the mastery you know, of, of power. In this case, actually, it becomes the, 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 the symbolize the centrality of the patron that organized these sort of uh, estates where, in fact, agriculture becomes the main protagonist. And that's actually why the villa has this unprecedented openness you know, towards the, the, the landscape. For me, actually, the most, uh, and I, this is the last uh, image, uh, the most uh, interesting uh, and, and powerful uh, enigmatic, in a way, uh, design by Palladio is the design for Villa Repeta. Unfortunately, it does, doesn't exist uh, anymore because it was destroyed by a fire, if I'm not wrong, in the 17th century, where, in fact, the central uh, pavilion disappeared. The villa, I mean, it's of course reduced to this rather uh, small pediment. Uh, the villa becomes an enormous barquesa, where in fact there is no difference between uh, the peasants, the workers, and, and, the, and the patrons. Uh, it is known that the Repetta were uh, strong sympathizers for uh, 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 the Protestant uh, confession, and therefore they had this rather unprecedented uh, uh, welfare approach towards the peasants that would work in their uh, estate. And it's interesting how this, uh, the rise of this new ethos, this new understanding you know, of social relationship, no longer based on uh, aristocracy, but based on economy, and in the end, the villas are productive uh, uh, epicenters, is symbolized by an architecture that we will see much uh, in the pre next uh, uh, let's say, uh, chapters, which is purely based on the organization of space, where in fact the representation seems to almost uh, disappear. No? So, what for, so it's interesting to compare the way Palladio ends uh, his book. Uh, well, in this case, he doesn't end his book, but his uh, second book, uh, and the way actually um, Serlio ends his uh, books on architecture. Serlio ends with this rather tragicomic celebration of the absurd in architecture. So Vitruvian architecture, yes, is important, but at the end, we don't know really what to do with it. And the only way we can uh, play with it is to make these rather absurd uh, combinations of uh, genres and forms. You know? Palladio actually, uh, on the contrary, uh, ends his, of course, uh, uh, second book uh, with a building uh, that is um, purely uh, based on organization, where in fact the problem of representation does not exist anymore because the ruler, the patrons, have in fact uh, left empty that kind of uh, uh, place, uh, the place of uh, representation, and they have become embedded in the very way architecture organizes uh, something that in fact is, is unrepresentable, which would be the fundamental asset of uh, Protestant, but later on capitalist uh, ethics, which is basically production. Something that, of course, in the uh, Alberti uh, and Serio was far more relatively uh, important. But with Palladio, in fact, this uh, idea of uh, production and the way architecture not simply represent but organize uh, production will be uh, very important.
Thank you. Uh, there are questions. I know that some of you have to leave because it's uh, 3 past 2. But uh, if there is some question, I would uh, be very glad to, to answer or comments or critique, uh, disagreement. Uh, this is, a, uh, as I told you, a rather uh, superficial overview, which uh, I'm sure uh, I think would require much more uh, refinement. Uh, so if you have questions, I can elaborate certain rather rudimental passages of my presentation. Yes. Uh, you have to speak on the microphone because we are broadcast. It's a part of that refugation that I was uh, How stressful. Talking about. Um, there is something interesting about um, the function of uh, Barqueza uh, in Villa Rotonda. I mean, we don't have the plan here, but I wonder if you could say something about that. Well, because in Villa Rotonda, actually, there are no Barquesas. But uh, there, there are kind of separated from, from the actual. Um, no, Villa Rodonda, there are no Barquesas, I'm pretty sure. Actually, Villa Rodonda was, is not even mentioned by Palladio in the section of villas, but is mentioned in the section of uh, palaces. And in fact, we call, we call it uh, Villa Rotonda, but it was not a villa. It was a sort of uh, amenity, uh, building for amenity, just next to Vicenza. And in fact, the building uh, has no barque, it's not a productive, uh, let's say, building. So there are no barquesas. You might confuse uh, maybe with uh, other uh, examples, but for there sure, a Villa, Rodonda, a Villa Rodonda actually is not a villa, actually. <laughs> there is, yeah, there is um, one, maybe, yeah, I'm con then confusing it with something else, um, where uh, Barquesas are completely separated. Yes, and there they, are. Yes, um, and yeah. then they have completely different different function. As this, uh, um, it's a it's a road that leads people into the villa and um, frames certain um, views on of the landscape. Um, but yeah, anyhow, thank you. Yes, uh, there, of course there are different. I mean, I show you uh, only two versions, three versions. But um, yes, Barquesas were not necessarily attached. To the to the main body, the, the palace itself, they were sometimes uh, detached. But um, like for example, Villa Foscari, uh, but they were always part of the same compound. So this, uh, in fact, actually, you know, when uh, one of the historians that have made Palladio important uh, recently, uh, more than sixty years ago, was Witkover, no, with his. Um, a book uh, on uh, Palladian architecture. And one of the most uh, crucial, uh, let's say, uh, no, actually, the book is, of course, Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism, uh, sorry, which is a book before. And one of the fun uh, iconic pages of that book is this famous page where Bitcover make diagrams of all the villas by, not all the villas, but the main villas of uh, Palladio. And one of the interesting things of the diagrams is that uh, Bitcover does not include uh, Barquese. He only actually make the diagram of the central body, which for me is a very interesting way of reading Palladio's villas, because he almost amputates uh, Palladio's villas of the most important uh, element, uh, which were actually the, the Barquese. And actually, Barques is actually where very often Palladio, I mean, apart from this example, does not use architectural orders. He uses rather normal, literal uh, columns. Other uh, PhD student? Yes. You, you, are, you are supposed to make quests, I mean, yeah. PhD, because this is a PhD seminar, so I'm supposed <laughs> yeah. to talk to you. I, uh, I don't know if you can help me. I've been reading Tafuri on Palladio and on Serlio, uh, but yeah. sometimes I get confused uh, in his interpretations uh, when he speaks about both in terms of syntactic variability and Anars Combinatoria. And, uh, 
but I can get for him or in your interpretation what's the main difference between the contribution of Palladio as opposed to Serlios in those terms? Yeah, I mean, first a little note, footnote on, on uh, Palladio's writings, both on Serlio and Palladio, which are absolutely extraordinary. The article, which might be the one that you are reading, is uh, this uh, article on the religiousness of Serlio, which is one of the most important texts by Tafuri on Serlio. Uh, which is, it's a very important uh, text, but has a, uh, I mean, it shows what was Tafuri's uh, main pleasure uh, in uh, reading architecture, which was his incredible sadic uh, pleasure in choosing architects that would create uh, the most impossible architectural compositions. So he really indulged in this kind of um, sort of rather bizarre way through which Serlio presents uh, architecture. Uh, for me, um, I think that the problem of Tafuri's uh, reading of Serlio is that it stops uh, there. And it doesn't actually see uh, Serlio in a much uh, larger uh, picture, where in fact this uh, rather bizarre, if not clumsy, approach uh, is, um, has a certain narrative uh, which is uh, very strong and is a narrative that we see also in Embryo in Alberti. On one hand, to create a book on architecture means to make a book about uh, the art of government or governing uh, a certain range of knowledge and, uh, and, and, and tools to govern and represent the city and, and, and architecture. But at the same time, there is an, an element of irony. And irony, of course, is a word that today doesn't mean anything anymore. Everybody seems to be ironic in architecture. Uh, but irony, uh, there is something tragic in irony. Irony is the, jet, let's say, the, well, I would say irony, which is the possibility of detaching yourself from the problem you are addressing, is the, 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 uh, precedent of rationalism. In order to be rational, meaning to not be emotionally involved no, in this, what we have seen with, I mean, the, the monuments of Dürer really shows that impossibility. No? Dürer is really emotionally involved. I mean, he's one of the first artists to convert uh, to, to the Protestant reform. You really, I mean, Max Weber uh, in his book on the Protestant ethics tells about how there were so many people killing themselves in this struggle and dilemma, no? whether to choose to remain Catholic or to embrace the, the reform. No? So it was an ethical struggle which was in very strong and, and Dürer. I mean, the art of Dürer, especially his late work, is really a representation of that. And he ends up by doing these rather absurd uh, monuments. No? Serlio, like Dürer, uh, of course, is also a sympathizer of this new uh, sensibility, but is also, uh, to use a term by Alexander uh, Nagel, a soft uh, iconoclast. Uh, someone who is always trying to, uh, uh, let's say, clean. I mean, for example, Salio repeats very often the word simplicity, but not too much. I mean, it's not really, uh, it's simplicity is not simple, because you all, all, always have this kind of uh, possibilities of, of of uh, uh, sin, let's say, to use a evangelic language, but that for sellers are opportunities to have redemption, uh, which is a, a very dialectical, very conflictual way to, to understand the moral meaning of architecture, which I think Tafuri was, for Tafuri was very important. Venice, uh, where Sally actually spent part of his life, uh, is a city because it's mercantilist, uh, let's say, uh, identity, is a city that at that moment uh, has, um, becomes actually the harbor of all these uh, people uh, that are trying to contest the moral, uh, let's say, prerogatives of the Catholic Church. You know? For example, people like Pietro Aretino is living in Venice. You know, there are a series of figures that uh, are very familiar to Serlio. And that's actually what, what really constitutes Sergio's work. I think Palladio is far more, more straightforward. Palladio is already beyond uh, that struggle, is more operative. And actually, uh, Palladio is a sort of 
resurrection, if you want, of the Brunelleschi's uh, approach, you know? But of course, after uh, Bramante and after Serlio. And I think that uh, my, I think it's clear that Palladio owns a lot to Serlio. Without Serlio, we wouldn't have Palladio. And Serlio is always not recognized in this kind of uh, continuity. Uh, but of course, uh, Palladio, unlike Serlio, is far more close uh, to power, in this case the Republic and the patrons, uh, especially the younger uh, party you know, within the Serenissima Republic, uh, which in fact promotes basically his uh, architecture, unlike Serlio, who would uh, have no opportunities, if not uh, very few at the end of his life, to, to build something. So I think the difference is really about uh, I mean, Serlio is a strange, I mean, I, I love Serlio. I mean, it's one of my heroes. Uh, it's, it's, he's both tormented and ironical. And I think these are qualities that uh, neither, uh, nor actually, I mean, Vignola is really, uh, is much more talented than Serlio, but doesn't have this uh, struggle. But uh, Serlio had that sort of, which in fact, you can see in, uh, in Palladio. Okay, I think, uh, okay, ah, yes, one, Umberto. I only have seven minutes of recording. Ah, okay, so we will, we will be done. Can I limit the question as well? It's just, um, I was just hoping whether you could just sort of maybe reiterate a little bit the last point about uh, the reformist impact on Palladio and uh, because I'm a little bit unclear also like how this sort of it's in with the whole kind of Calvinist, you mentioned capitalist kind of influence and stuff, and at the same time how in this uh, repeta you can see how it's kind of superficially sort of democratic, but at the same time, well, I mean, obviously not. I would say it's not superficially. Yeah, yeah, of course, but like. I mean, for the standards of that time, uh, this uh, gesture is pretty strong. <coughs> I mean, of course, there is a paternalism, uh, the, but architecture itself is always paternalistic. I mean, even when it wants to be democratic, Architecture will always, and, and the more you want to be democratic, the, the more you will uh, be paternalistic. Eh? And for sure there is an element of that. Uh, but um, uh, this is exactly, uh, I mean, what I, I think is important to realize that the, the, the clash between Catholicism and, and, and the Protestant reform. First of all, this is one of the major event, uh, in, if not the major event in Western culture, because it's not a, a, only about a struggle between two confessions, but it's a struggle between a, an old form of um, power mastery and a new uh, social and political ethos that, of course, has to question radically uh, the religious theological uh, framework. Um, and it has a huge impact on, on both sides. Not only actually, I mean, it's, you cannot say uh, the Protestants, because actually they hated the way religion was very often materialized into objects, so that they promote this kind of idea that religion should not be represented in a way. But they also forced the, the, the Catholic counterpart uh, to, 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 to change, to reform itself. Uh, to return to, for example, a, a much more straightforward uh, form of representation. Actually, the, the, the historian was mentioning before, Alexander Nagel, no, talks about strategies of soft uh, uh, iconoclasm. So in a way, not iconoclasm like, uh, but like this. No? So to make a villa that looks like a villa, by the way, uh, but there is this kind of uh, attempt to basically uh, respond to these urgencies, to this kind of new mentalities, where in fact this uh, strong hierarchical organization that we see in the other villas was too strong. I mean, in a way, for me, what is interesting is that the villas of Palladios are, they look very static and hierarchical, but they are the outcome of profound uh, social and economic conflicts, uh, which forced, uh, uh, in fact, the, the patron, uh, I mean, we always see the you know, power in, in one direction, but power goes always in two directions because it's not only the power who is imposing a project, but there is also the power who resists 
that project. So you can read that in the Villa Emo, for example, that power has centralized everything in one body with the barchessi attached to the building. But you can read this project also in, in the other way, that power was forced to accept that peasants, which till then had no whatsoever possibility to find a, a, a decent space to live, to be actually accommodated on the same uh, ground of the, of the patrons. So in a way, uh, you know, reform and counter reform is, 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 a, is, a, is a struggle where both sides have, uh, whether one is lo winner or loser, have something to gain. You know? something, it's, 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 it's an opportunity for them to change and to reform their own uh, language. And of course, Palladio is in the middle of that. But I think that uh, while Serlio belongs to a generation that is still struggling ethically, I mean, there is a strong ethical suffering through it, through Serlio's reflections on architecture. In Palladio, almost this suffering doesn't exist anymore. Palladio has found a way you know, to, to tame, to control these uh, struggles in a language that is uh, very stable because it's instability uh, and will proliferate uh, for the next uh, three centuries, uh, uh, not only in Europe, but also in the United States. Uh, Jefferson was a big admirer of uh, Palladio. Okay, see you next week.